Welcome everybody. I would like to welcome you to Women of Science 2020, our last uh, talk of this week. With no further ado, I will hand it over to Chloe to introduce our guest. Hi everyone. Dr. Renata Ferreira is a biologist trained in comparative psychology and biological anthropology and is currently a professor at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, Brazil and a, re a visiting researcher at Concordia University. Her research focuses on personality, behavioral plasticity, and resilience to stress of capuchin monkeys living in hum human altered habitats, zoos, rescue centers, reintroduced animals, and animals living in Atlantic forest fragments. For the last eight years, she has been a part of the Environmental Ministry Council for Conflict Resolution and Management of Endangered Primate Species in Northeast Brazil. Okay, so I thank you very much. Uh, shall I start sharing my screen then? Let me start here. Are you seeing it? Okay. Is it okay? Yes, it's good. Okay, good. So I'll just hide you so I can see my... Okay, so I'd like to thank you all, Stephanie, Lisiane, for inviting me for this uh, week that has been fantastic. I really appreciate it very much. And to share my experience and maybe, um, maybe form some collaborative links here for, for us. So the title of my talk is Back into Wild, Ex Situ Rehabilitation and In Situ Survivorship of Reintroduced Capuchin Monkeys. I am here at Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. For those of you, I put that live right in the corner by the beach, the city by the beach. And I'm actually doing a sabbatical at the University of Quebec. It's not Concordia. Sarah is my friend, actually, and that she is in Concordia. So, but I'm here. So, but before I start my talk, I would like actually to thank the opportunity to share a little bit of my trajectory here. Right, because uh, as a scientist, as uh, it's normally a part that we do not put in our talks, right, in the scientific meeting. So, I'm a bachelor in biology, and my interest in biology started by the reading of these two books, *The Naked Ape* and *The Animal Contract* by Desmond Morris, that I read while I was in uh, a high school, and it's about how humans are really only primates or special primates. And then I just know, so I have to do biology and I will know all this team of instincts, what we have as instincts and all that, everything. And although nowadays I have criticisms of the contents of these two books, I acknowledge that they were the books that really brought me and sparked my interest in this team. And while I was doing my, my bachelor in biology that I finished in 1995, I also read this book, The Selfish Gene. And, and it's about simply a book that says that, uh, while I was interested in human nature, that just says that we are all selfish. And I said, can that be true? We are all selfish. How can that be? And, and I was so in, in crisis, that sparked a crisis that actually lingers in me until today. So one of the things that for one of the strategies to study um, instinct behavior or natural behavior is actually studying toddlers or kids that are not really, really in culture. So my undergraduate, we final uh, writing that we have that was on comforting behavior in toddlers because why do toddlers care for the others if we are naturally selfish, right? So, and that was this, and that was a question that I took along my master's in comparative psychology that I did in University of Sao Paulo, changed states, and I studied social network and comforting behavior. So a toddler, and a toddler I'm saying, uh, kids, I went into schools, to uh, nurseries and pouponier, and I, study kids uh, less than three years old. So I was focusing on one, once one kid cried or suffered something, what the other kids would do. 
So how, why would they care? So if you have this caring behavior, how can we be so selfish? How can our nature be so selfish? So that was, and I was studying this in my comparative psychology masters. But then I saw, no, I figured out that studying humans is really difficult. There are so many variables to take account. And then I moved to uh, University of Cambridge in England where I did a PhD in biological anthropology and that's why when I moved to capuchin monkeys. But I was still worried about a social network and coalitionary behavior. Why coalitionary behavior? Because it's considered a super altruistic behavior. If two individuals are fighting and a third decides to interfere, this is a super risky and costly behavior. Why would you do that? Why would you simply, no, let them to fight and kill each other. Why would a third individual interfere? So that was my, my concern in that moment. And then uh, I, this hard period of postdoc, right? When you are looking for positions, which was five years, while well, I was hired to by a Department of Development Environment already at Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte to study the primate humans coexistence. I finally got a position in 2010. So you have to be, when I said in Wednesday that you have to be resilient to be a teacher, it's really a long journey, be a scientist. And then I went to do my sabbatical in veterinary science at the University of Bristol, my first sabbatical. And now I am doing my second sabbatical here at the University of Quebec or Montreal in evolution and ecology. So I put this just to show you that I am anything but a specialist. I went to different fields, but I was also trying to answer the same question. How do individuals behave in groups and how, and but always from the perspective or a little bit of touch of biology. And I was really glad of the talk before that she said that we in science, we are locked, we, we do not see the wisdom of indigenous people. And more than that, each of these helm in science, they can be locked in itself. So even within science, it's a really closed, and it took a, a strength for me because it's somehow to speak different languages. Every time I'm moving here, I need to know who is the guy, what is the paradigm, who is saying that and how to translate that. So now I consider myself a polyglot in this. And maybe I was lucky enough to always find pe people and groups of research that acknowledge and welcomes this multidisciplinary and all these languages that we can speak to answer one single question, how individuals behave in group, that as always. So um, I'm gonna, th this is just to give a, a background for don't be afraid to change areas. It's good, it gives you a broader perspective. But this talk, in this talk I'll focus more my research on capuchin monkeys that it was from my PhD so I start saying why capuchin monkeys are interesting. What are the problems they're facing now of rescue and refination? What can we do in terms of rehabilitation and reintroduction of animals? So I work my work. I'm also fortunate to work both ex situ, so I have lab experience and field work experience. So maybe I'm just an hybrid. And maybe that's why I chose Montreal or Canada because you are also bilingual. So maybe I like this double side. So why is capuchin interesting? So this is a capuchin monkey. Okay, these are how capuchin monkeys, they look like. They occupy all Latin America from Amazonia to dry areas, Caatinga and Cerrado, Atlantic forest. There are eight species. Two are endangered, these two are endangered, Flavius, uh, blonde and yellow breasted and two are vulnerable. And I studied this yellow one, yeah, blonde and the 
Birded capuchins, and I today will talk more about this research here. Capuchin monkeys, they are interesting for two main reasons. So they weight between 2.5 and 3 kilos, 60 centimeters. So they are considered medium to large size mammals. Okay. They eat everything, and that's why they can occupy all different biomes. They live up to 35 years, forming large groups from 16 to 60, even larger. And more importantly, they form matrilineal tolerant societies. So this is, uh, this is what we say about tolerances. So this guy's eating, and it allows the other to eat of it. So this is eating. They're also looking. So they are tolerant animals. Most importantly, why they are excellent models for comparative psychology and evolutionary biology? Because they are large brained. So for many measures you can take, this is just one of the graph. If you take the body size and the brain size, capuchin monkeys, they are always above the expected. This means that they have more brain to the size, to the body size that would be expected. At the same time, they have a type of uh, a foraging strategy that is called manipulative extractive with two use. They use stones to crack open nuts. They use sticks to dig holes, to dig uh, insects from the holes of the trees. So they are fantastic models for a period in evolution, human evolution, known as Homo habilis. So they're fantastic, okay, for this. And this large brain, there are two theories for this. Is this, they have large brain because they are doing this to finding food or because it's for social Machiavellian intelligence, as I said in the, in the preview. So when I did my PhD, I was, supervised by a strong woman. I put a picture here because we are we, women of science. She has just retired. I'm really proud to be have been her uh, student. And I studied capuchin monkeys already in highly disturbed environment. This is a park. If you go to Sao Paulo or if you go to Brazil and you land in Sao Paulo, you certainly pass through this avenue here. This is a park surrounded by cities. And this is considered a natural experiment, right? Because it's not a continuous forest. And I was testing social ecological models. Social ecological models, they say that females are firstly gregarious because of the costs of pregnancy, the costs of lactation. And their gregariousness is dependent on food distribution. If there is more food, there can be more females, right? And also on predation his risk, more predation risk, the more they are together. So this is the, the structure of uh, social ecological models. And that males are attached to females depending on the services that they can offer to them. Because, and males emigrate from the group. So my main question was, how individuals deal with increased density given the lack of immigration that was this, and especially how males would be, how females would be. And what I found is that contrary to all that Machiavellian theory, I found that males ensured their permanence in female groups by increasing the care for infants. So this was my first publication, Bird Predation and Prey Transfer in Brown Capuchin Monkeys. So when a male got a bird, instead of going out and eating by himself, they would go towards the group and share this bird, especially with infants. I also found that males conduct protective interventions so remember I was talking about coalition. So when are two individuals, the male goes there and protects normally the juveniles. So what I was having was a picture of an animal that is anything but Machiavellian, but competitive. I was, um, females were gregarious and males were helping females into this group. And so it was good actually 
now that when I when I was trying to publish this back then in 2006, I said, oh my God, this is not going to be accepted because I need to say they're they're selfish. I need to say they're competitive. But I'm glad that science evolved and we moved from Machiavellian power and sex perspective to a more social brain distributed mind, peacemaking. So now that view of humans as naturally selfish are changing, are changing. We can be more cooperative and Capuchin Monkeys is helping in changing this picture. And oops, so just to give you here an idea, they are, Capuchin Monkeys are now in the front cover of very important magazines about social learning, for example, because in order to learn, you have to be tolerant to the individuals that are nearby. They do not have teachers, right? So they learn by allowing the other individuals to be near you and they observe your behavior. So this tolerance, this that is important. So here you can see Cebus, which is the Capuchins, right? They are right on top. They are not in terms of pro-sociality. Not as much as human science yet, but still a lot. So that was a good thing to see a change in science itself. Uh, we have a previous perspective and now we have another perspective and it was possible, made possible by studying other models, other animals. But then the hardest part, you finish your PhD and you are there in your postdoc period. I got a position in, um, in a department of uh, environment and development and my goal was to map the population of capuchins that occurred due to a major construction that was taking place in Brazil, which is they are constructing a channel to link this river here to these three rivers here. It's still taking place, right? So they're doing a channel here. And I was hired to map the populations here, especially I was mapping the populations here in this river so these points here, I helped mapping, right? So while I was mapping this, what is going on? This traditional, what is going on with this population? Right? So major development arrives and changes the whole dynamic of the previous, uh, previous population. So what was to be traditional extensive livestock was changing into agriculture. Mostly what was the scenario between this, this period? It was animals being encroached into the hillsides and a lot of traditional agriculture uh, taking place and animals being kept by humans as pets. That's what I found. So while the animals were being out of their natural areas, they are being crushed and closer and closer to human populations. Most than it, there were a lot of animals in rescue centers, right? So just to give you an idea, in just one year, in one rescue center, SETA is the acronym for rescue center, 292 primates have been kept to this rescue center. And in another one, 503 primates. In an overall uh, uh, review, about 90,000 animals are received per year in rescue centers. Of these 15% are mammals, and of these 15%, one third are primates. Calitrix marmoset is the most uh, found in rescue center, and sebos, the capuchin monkeys, are the second most found. These are is a traditional structure of a rescue center, a traditional one. And what happened to them? Where, oh, I forgot to translate this. Where do these animals go? 20% die, another third stay in captivity, and half of them are released, so Tura, they are released back into the wild. So my goal, when I finally got a, uh, a position in 2010 in the psychobiology postgraduate program is actually to work with these animals in a project of 
brief formation. So these animals they are rescued, they are prepared, and they are returned to nature as a measure to avoid uh, decline of species, right? So as a, a proactive conservation, you don't have to wait for the species to be endangered. They are already vulnerable. So in order to avoid from one species to change from vulnerable to uh, endangered, we can just get them and refound, okay, to change them. So, and this is just, and this a view of a rescue center, a view of my students, and we try to follow all steps. We help and help all steps of the of the refoundation protocol. They arrive, we assess, we rehabilitate, we test them that if they are right, we release them, and we follow them. So this is a group, for example, that are being released in these three areas. So this is a 25 and a lot of people here. All these refoundation uh, strategy for conservation, it involves a lot of, of you can contribute as another teacher also said, another talker, it's just a drop that we can contribute, but we can put a drop in each one of these areas here. So for example, in area of restoration ecology and wildlife conservation and animal temperament causes and consequences of captive, reintroduced and wild populations. So we can talk about how variation in behavioral response to human-induced rapid environmental change, plastic animals in, in cages, behavioral flexibility and response to captivity, comparative biology of environmental stress, so behavioral endocrinology and vari variation ability to cope with novel change environment, to ethical discussions. Is euthanasia an option? Shall we just, there is a, a group of researchers that say that these rescued animals, they should be simply euthanized. They are already lost. So just to give an idea that we can contribute to the little drop in each of this, and let me show you how I can contribute. So just a little bit of the theoretical perspective. In studies of evolution of behavior, one major paradigm is that you have two major axes of reaction to stress, personality and stress coping strategies, right? You have the proactive and the reactive form of stress, okay? The proactive is linked to hyperactivity, anxiety, drug abuse, and the reactive is linked to this depression, self-mutilation that we see in humans, right? So these are considered two conserved axes of stress responses. So just to give an idea, when you are relaxed, you have two major, it's one axis with two major axes, one axis, two major profile of personality. You can be bold or you can be quiet, docile. When you are stressed, the bold individuals start panic and the shy, the docile individuals start shy. They opted for shy, not depressed. So this is the theoretical framework. And this axis of proactive, reactive, bold, docile has been found in several species. There, there is even a study saying that you have anemona that are bold or shy. And you have cockroach that are bold or shy. They are conserved, they are, they are interpreted as conser evolutionary conserved axis of reaction. So this is my most, the theoretical background I use in the psychobiology program to approach this problematic of how to reintroduce individuals, how which individuals will survive better after release. So when the individuals arrive, we conduct the total scan of the individuals. We take body measurement, heart rate, everything. We take blood samples, for example, here to see which of animals are anemic. Each individuals are with indication of inflammation. 
So we do the complete screen of the individuals and we give medicines or supplemental, feeding supplemental, whatever they need in order to be fine. Then we put the individuals in the group. So we have here many enclosures where we put the individuals here. This is a newcomer here. And that's what my, my students spend most of the time. And we take care of, we take notes of their behavior. So this is just to give an idea of the name of, this is the students, they put the name, Chewbacca, Arthur, Hulk, Beethoven. This is the students, they put the name in the animals. And we have, we take note of their behaviors, right? It's to know how healthy, cognitive and behaviorally they are. So now just to show, we have a screen of more than 200 captive capuchin monkeys and we, we take fecal samples, blood samples, we take this just to give an idea. So we have what we have groups of students that they take care of some groups of animals and they follow the animals there. This is something I cannot show you, but because I missed the gift, but I was wanting to know, do individuals differ actually in stress coping strategies. So this was supposed to be an example of the um, hyperphagia or when the individuals, they eat a lot, they eat and vomit, they eat and vomit, here's the vomit. Here's an example of self-mutilation. And here is an example of anxiety, they just keep in circles. If in the end, maybe I can pass this GIF, it's really nice. So just to give an idea, so each point here is an animal, males and females in different colors. So when we see, for example, self-grooming, cleaning one's fur, it's right variable. We cannot really differentiate individuals. But we, when we see crouching behavior, all individuals, they do crouch a little bit, but some individuals, they crouch more. So we can ping pong that this individual number 78, number 81, 27, 25, these are individuals that they are crunching much above the, the mean of the group. Are they fine? So that's one of the first indication. Another thing, this is a really nice, I, I like one, this is masturbation behavior. So what you can see here is that it's zero. So it's zero scaled. So mean scaled, what I say. So we can see that everybody masturbates a, lot, a little bit, some less, some more. So we can pinpoint which are these individuals. Are these stressed? What are, or what are happened to these guys that are showing less of masturbatory behavior? Just to, to give an idea that we can differentiate individuals. So what we found is that when we overall, we found that yes, we do found two axes of um, Stress, uh, stress reaction that seems to be conserved, that we call it restless and self-protection. But we also find three other axes of reaction. So the discussion in this paper that we publishes is that while we do find the conserved axis, because capuchin monkeys, they are large-brained, maybe they present uh, a more diverse strategies to cope with stress than only those conserved. So, and this is related to their large brain that make us more complex as and nice models for humans to understand. Another thing we do, we do moving from stress to personality. So we do some behavioral tests of personality and these are most, I'm going to present the pictures of my students because to acknowledge that is their work, they are there doing that. So we do behavioral tests and we do analysis of cortisol. And what are we find? We found four axes of personality, feeding, sociability, exploratory, and activity. They are composed by different behaviors. So what is important here is that each individual, they do have these four axes. What they differ is in the amount of the behavior they exhibit here. So we found four axes of personality and we found four stress coping strategies when we increased our sample size, self-directed, restless, ingestion and self-scratching and stereotyping. So 
the self-direction of the individuals are crouching, bouncing, so this is more related to depression. Restless, it's about self-grooming, oh, masturbation and pacing. This is more about related to anxiety. Ingestion, those are individuals that are bulimic, they eat and vomit. Any stereotype are tick, behavioral tics. Okay, they are more idiosyncratic. So we did found uh, four axes of personality that are related to four axes of stress reaction. These four axes of stress reaction, they do have different cortisol levels, which is a indicator of stress, right? So individuals that are more sociable, for example, they have less, if you see the negative sign here, they have less cortisol, median, mean, and maximum. So it seems that the axis of sociability is something that helps individuals in this context, which is crowded, right? And it's interesting to know that now, just a diversion, now that we are in quarantine, it seems that the less sociable individuals are suffering less because they are already less sociable, right? At least, uh, uh, I'm, that's my observation from my students. <laughs> it's not a real, but it seems so. This axis of, of personality, they do differ in routine management. So again, sociability, individuals that are more sociable, when they change enclosure, they show less peak of cortisol, while individuals that are less sociable, they have a higher increase of cortisol in the third period, which is in this case, the second week of change. So really being sociable in this context, again, uh, it seems to be a, a good trait for personality. Exploration is also a good one. So individual more explorative, they, they show less increase in cortisol, while individuals that are less explorer, they show in a higher increase. So what we're seeing is that personality seems to protect you from stress or this specific type of stress, right? We also conduct rehabilitation. So how individuals differ if different personality do they rehab differently? We conduct three main rehabilitation procedures, manipulative, locomotor, and social manipula uh, rehabilitation. They have to uh, rehab in this. And here, so we put a lot of enrichment that they eventually destroy. So this has to be even renewed and then renewed. So what we see is that it seems to have some effect in locomotion. We have to figure out yet how to increase this use of the top area. But what we can see is that individuals that do have a larger behavior repertoire, they also use more substrates. So it seems to be a, a good indicator that use of substract and behavior better. So we can see here the individuals that are better prepared while individuals that show behavior potentially indicative of stress, they show decreased use of substrates. So individuals more stressed, they do not use, so they crouch or they stay in just one area of the environment. So these are part of the studies we're conducting. Foraging, so we are training animals to dig in floor to find and to use tools. And we see that along the time, the number of, how, the longer they stay manipulating, the more they can have. So they're learning that and foraging increases here. So we, we trained, for example, 39 individuals in one session 29 individuals in two training sessions, 18 in three training six, and they do have, so four training sessions is to be a good moment for them to really learn this. So but most of them can learn super fast this, which is good. We are now seeing which individuals are learning better than others. Here is uh, the study on social integration so we have to form groups, right? We have to form groups to release them. And 
We have here the axis of personality, assertiveness, openness, neuroticism, sociability, and attentiveness. And what we said is, and that's interesting, individuals that are more assertive, they also have more affiliation. That's, uh, uh, and we, we, are, we are repeating this. We are writing now a paper called Tough Love. It seems that uh, individuals that are more assertive, they, although they're assertive, they also affiliated more. We are trying to interpret this. And individuals that are considered more neurotic, they present a higher increase of agonism. So our conclusion is that by screening the personality of the individuals, we may try to form better stable group for release or even for maintenance. This is also conducted by two other individuals, or oh, two other students that are helping us. And the final part, which is the most important, Will these individuals survive after release? That's, that's one of the questions that we are preparing this for them to be returning back into the wild, right? So we get them, the monkeys, we take, this was one release, one, one period that we released them in islands. We released 71 individuals in three different islands. So we took them, put them and we followed them for six months and some of them die. Some of them die after release. Okay, so this was, we still were not rehabilitation then. We did not have protocols. It was just the, the beginning of the study. So what we saw is that um, half of the individuals, they died in the first six months, actually. But, and now women of science, females were surviving more than males. Yeah, here. A good news is that after 10 years of the release, I came back to an island and 20% were still alive. So we released 10 individuals in one island, two were still alive. So although half die, 20% survive. Is this worth? Is this, what does it say in terms of refoundation and reintroduction as a conservation strategy? And how can we improve this survivorship. So this again, um, individual differences, personality and survivorship analysis. We studied the acts of boldness, aggressiveness, neophilia, sociability, exploration, activity, food oriented and vigilance. So we, we screened at this axis and what we saw that predicted increased survivorship was neophilia and activity. Those are the ones that significantly predicted increased survival with more neophilic individuals. So individuals that eat anything that is new in captivity, right? These tests are doing in captivity and then we release them. So when this neophilia test is, is one of the pictures I showed before, we present new food to them. Do they choose the new food or the known food? And the individual that choose the new food survived more after release. And the less active individuals survived more after release. And more active individuals, they died super fast. So the conclusions we have this is that if you are going to a new area, be quiet and eat anything. This will help you to survive. Probably because new food in a new area and maybe because as you are active, you are more exposed to predators. So you have your increased chance to be predated. So just be quiet, see where the predators are and eat anything. And this is a really, we are super happy with this result because it seems that it can have, we can predict and maybe choose animals to that are they will be better able to survive and increase the success of refoundation with this type of screening on behavior we also monitor the movement after release so each color this is one individual right and we could not conduct many statistical analysis here because 
uh, only nine individuals who have the radio colors. We are, I'm here writing projects to have radio colors and follow them so I can have exactly where they move here. So we also measure the impact on local fauna. It's not known. So here are the, the they are eating the eggs of a small turtle that are in the area. So what is the impact of refoundation? So all this discussion, where should we relocate them? So as a conclusion, capuchin monkeys and humans, they coexist for a long time. This is a painting of a capuchin monkeys at Serra da Capivara. Serra da Capivara, we know it's a capuchin monkey by the, this girl and the tail here, the girl and the tail. So they're existing with us since pre-Columbian times, okay? They coexisted with us. The problem is that now with the increase of cities, they're coming closer and closer to us, right? So this is a picture of a mom with a baby invading a house, for example. These photos and this photo is in, in the campus of a university, right? So they're getting closer and closer to us. And this can cause diseases. And now that with the pandemics, we're more, I think the global opinion is aware of the risk of this too close proximity to wildlife, right? And this is, for example, an outspurt to have of yellow fever in Brazil and a lot of animals dying and transmitting, not, they do not transmit yellow fever, but the mosquitoes can transmit. So it was a major problem. And we are now just starting a collaborative research in that we, before waiting for the animals to go to the rescue center, we study them and already scream them in the houses of the people, right? They are there, you can see the chain, which is normal. So, and we already screening their health the status and everything there. And I'm trying to contribute you know, my little drop uh, in this discussion of conservation and hyphenation in many different uh, fronts, right? Not just one. So I try to work in science, capuchin monkeys research priority and research and urgent issues. So we are trying to pinpoint what, what are the needs for conservation of capuchin monkeys. I am working in the governmental agency for protection of endangered species and management of conflicts of the population, right? So you can see here, we, we are focusing on five species and two of them are capuchins. So I'm working on this. And because it's important for the broader audience and I invite you all students, please join, follow us at Instagram, Operação Sapajos. You may be able to see videos and more pictures and more of what we do there. We also have a website where you can see longer videos because in Instagram is just short videos. And so we can uh, work in the public, general public awareness. So now I am doing my, the major project is entitled Phenotypic Plastic and Resilience of Capuchin Monkeys in Disturbed Habitats. I'm working with rescued animals, reintroduced animals, translocated animals, animals in city borders. And so it's like this, huh? We are waiting the whole week for this. <laughs> we have partnership. I thank the partnerships. I thank all my colleagues, all my students. They are there in the field. They are conducting the data collection. My colleagues at UCAM, University of Bristol, Sao Paulo, California. My colleagues at the environmental agencies and hopefully you can come us and join us in one of these missions of screening and reintroducing the animals. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to um, invite everyone to please write a message in the chat which is now available. Um, uh, to um, show your appreciation and something that you will take away with you um, for the next hours and days that you think you'll continue to think about. 
Um, uh, I would like you to, if I could ask you a question. Um, I was just wondering about um, the places of introduction, reintroduction to for the monkeys. Uh, are the places known to these monkeys? And when they're released, are, have they been socialized together in these groups so that they know to communicate together or maybe stick together? Um, and uh, I think I missed how they came to, your, to you guys in the first place, to, to mm. your study in the first place. Okay, okay. So they are rescued animals, right? So they live in the city borders. Some of them are rescued by the environmental agency, but some of them they're just delivered by the people that find them and give them to us, okay? Some, some of the people that normally have them, they stay with them as pets, and then they, because they are highly manipulative, highly um, uh, destructive, so they bang. So they just give the animals back to us. And while there, yes, we do put them in the group. And that's one of the major difficulties to integrate and to form groups for release. They are released in groups. They're not released alone. So this is one of, that's why we have a major focus in forming groups because they have their social species. So they are released in, uh, in groups. The areas that they release, no, they do not know previously, although it's the same biome, okay? There is the same environment type of MR, but not that precise area. And that's why it's so important, the pause monitoring, pause release monitoring. That's why we need to know how are they moving. And the choice of area is mostly based on vegetation type and distance for human settlements. So it has to be a protected area apart from uh, human settlements. That's how we choose the area. Okay. I could ask a question too. Uh, how long does it take for you to um, like describe the personality of each individual? Like what kinds of tests you do and then how do you mix the different personalities in a group? Or are there certain uh, monkeys that you think would be like unlikely to survive and they end up not being released? So how does that work? So um, the releases, they take place every six months, either I want or not, okay? I'm trying to help is what I, they, in the past when I arrived, they just received the animals had them, kept them, are they sick? They wait for the quarantine period. Mm -hmm. And every six months, I just put them back. Poof, poof, okay. poof. That was when I found. And so, no, let me make this great science. Let me help this. I can do great science and at the same time help the, the conservation and help the agency. So I have six months normally to do everything. So. We screen the animals. Some animals, some animals cannot be released. For example, we had one that is with us until now. Her name is Kotoko K because she has the owner cut all her fingers, all her mm -hmm. fingers from hands, from the feet, and from the and the tip of the tail. Wow. So this cannot be released. This animal cannot be released. We tried to find a a, a place, a sanctuary. Uh, zoo that could take place. Another one that is blind. We cannot release this one. Another one that the, the owners used to give um, uh, uh, medicines to them that she's shaken. This one we could release her. It's, it's one of, she shake it, shake it, shake it. She was thin. And then we could socialize her. She gained weight. She gained weight. We could even see her copulating but still she is not ready for release. So some animals are not ready. Regarding the group formation, this is up to now, most on intuition, but that's why we're doing, these are precisely the data I brought here to analyze in my sabbatical. Mm -hmm. 
how we measure personality. We conduct three types of, of, of indication. We have behavior itself. We have the tests. I can, let me see here. Where are the tests? So for example, we have here novel object, novel food, human interaction, stuffed toy, hidden food, novel environment, and tunnel tests. So we conduct these tests, which are based on previous work. Hmm? And we try to distinguish curiosity, neophilia, creativity, persistence, aggressiveness. So these are the axes of personality that we try to measure using these tests. And we also have a questionnaire. There is a questionnaire that is already also validated, a questionnaire of in, we have 54 adjectives that the students, they rate the animals, the individuals from one to seven. So is this animal aggressive? So you rate it and we do correlation. Now we do some validation, statistical validation to figure out. So we have these three indicators of personality, behavior itself, tests, and questionnaire, from which we, we, we disentangle the axis. And then we correlate to rehabilitation and then to survivorship after that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, can I jump in quick, Seth? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Ferreira. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. That was super interesting. I just wanted to follow up on uh, Steph's question. Um, uh, when you're in reintroducing uh, the monkeys, are you doing it in an area where there are no other monkey populations already? Or are you introducing them to a location where there are already uh, or there is an established population primates? Two areas, two areas, we release them in three areas. In two areas, there are not known monkey populations. In one area, there is, which is the largest one, okay? And actually, um, normally when you say about refoundation, you should put in empty areas. That's why we started in this empty area. But I myself, I am more prone to, to release in areas where there are already animals because I think that the existence of animals there is a proof that they can survive there. If there is without animals, and um, how could you figure out nah, why, why do they disappear? But this is actually something that is done in collaboration with colleagues from geography department. And that's why I also talk about with Sara. So, and I'm looking for colleagues that could help us in this mapping of new areas. I, I am not myself the only responsible for that. I follow, I give my opinion, but all this satellite analysis and all this. And it also has to be, there is a legal problem because it has to be in an, in an area that is allowed for us to release the animals. But it's, hmm. there are two, two the both type. Uh, so that the data that you showed before, those were all pulled together? No. Let me show here. These were, we released it in islands. So these were released in islands. In these islands, there were no other individuals in these areas. They were empty. And this one, there are other individuals. This is a continuous area. And these, there are other individuals here. Well, so the reason I'm asking is the, like the previous slide to this one. Uh, the, uh, these data, I also noticed there seems to be a pretty strong correlation with a lack of aggressiveness, uh, there. Um, uh, my, my first thought when I saw that was, oh, okay, well, so these are monkeys that need to know their place uh, within a new group. Uh, if they're trying to get into this new environment where these other monkeys are, they got us, they can't be too pushy. They, they have to know their place. They have mm -hmm. to take whatever is left over. They got to take mm -hmm. the scraps and they have to not be mm -hmm. aggressive. Otherwise they're going to mm -hmm. get their butts kicked is mm -hmm. what I was sort of thinking about this. And you linked it to predators, which wasn't my initial thought. Uh, so that's why I was asking about whether you were introducing, reintroducing them or not. But the, these data here, they're all pooled from the three locations or is this really just from one or two locations? Those are from the islands. Okay. From the islands. 
Yeah, mm. so they were not. But that's interesting because one thing that did not actually went to statistically significant, it, it should be right, it seems so, huh? but it's not statistical. <laughs> But one of the things that I know, my first intuition was that the higher ranking individual, they diet super fast. So the, the alpha, they die in captivity. When they, then when we release, they die. And my guess was that because in captivity, as they are the higher ranking, they are used to be aggressive. They reach higher ranking by aggressiveness and they displace the other to find food. When they are in an area where they do have to find their own food, they can't, they die, <laughs> they die. But it did not show a uh, statistical significance. It's just, just a, a thought, but statistically it's just not. So. <laughs> also we Thank thought you. that boldness, boldness, it was something that survived because previous studies have shown that bold individuals survive more there is one study with foxes that show that bolder fox survive more. And although it seems, it also doesn't. It's also not significant. Uh, what was the or what was the sample size behind these again? Seventy-one. Okay. Pretty Seventy-one good. here. Yeah. Thanks. No. So Vlad is asking, do you think that conservation projects in Brazil are properly funded? No, certainly not, <laughs> certainly not. I don't know if conservation projects are properly funded anywhere, but certainly not in Brazil, certainly not in Brazil. And especially in these vulnerable species, most of the funding goes to already endangered species, which one at first sight, we should agree, they are already endangered, so the fund should go there. And But this vulnerable species is what I'm, I'm trying to argue when I apply for my fundings, is that you have to have a proactive, let's help them before they become endangered. Let's not wait for them to be endangered. And they are already vulnerable. They are not less threatened. They are endangered. They are vulnerable already. They are on the brink of becoming endangered. So with this argument, I'm being able to receive some, but not much. Yeah. Um, someone else is asking, from your experience, do animal behaviors change as their environment is threatened? Yes, in especially these um, more flexible. There are species that are more flexible and species that are less flexible, right? Uh, especially these omnivorous species, they can, they can uh, enlarge their diet breadth. So for example, in an area that I, I think I have this, I also study in this fragment. I did not show you this data. I, I also, there is also animals here in this fragment and in this fragment. And all this around is sugarcane plantations. And they go to the sugarcane and they eat the sugarcane. So this crop raiding behavior is, is so they, they are flexible and especially capuche monkeys, they are flexible. So I have another question. So when you were talking about that, uh, the transposition of the San Francisco River, um, were there, are you aware of any, anything that was done to connect the different fragments that were separated by the river? Like the different areas that now would be found on both sides? Yeah, no, no, they, I, to my knowledge, there are no, what they do is that they, they have 19 because it's there is one axis of which called eixo norte right they're mm -hmm. linking here and there is this eixo less they are also linking here okay. right so and what what they have in, in this eixo north they have 19 areas that are four kilometers away from this where they took the animals from here and they put in these 19 areas there mm -hmm. and they took all animals i i saw a, a, a seminar from a, one of the biologists of this transposition responsible for this re relocation. She said that she relocated 
194,000 animals. Wow. Yeah, from all, right, right from uh, invertebrates to vertebrates, 194,000 animals. They have took and put in this 19, but they do not connect. And what happened, the animals I receive are the ones either that they got it and brought to us, or simply those that escaped. They escaped and went to the hillsides. Nope. They escaped and stayed there, and they go to near population, and they start another example. They, they eat corn, and this can cause conflicts with them eat corn. And some of the people that get the, especially infants, they do that because they feel sorry. They feel they are protecting the animals, actually. Mm. So when you say, no, don't do that, but I'm protecting them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. It feels like it's a huge impact in that area. And even if you're, yes, you're saving the animals from a certain area that is being like, that is under construction, you're not necessarily saving them because you don't know how well they will adapt to the new areas where they are being introduced to. Yes. And at the same time, they are accumulating rescue center. Mm -hmm. There is a group of colleagues that say that they should simply be euthanized. Mm -hmm. I do not belong to this group. I don't think, no, give them a chance. If, even if only 20% survive, it's 20% that survive. I'm not killing 100%. So it's another debate that we have to face there. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ferreira, I have a question about the uh, evolutionarily conserved behavior that you mentioned uh, reg regarding bold versus shy. Mm -hmm. And these, um, a, so you mentioned cockroaches and all of that. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so I was thinking, oh, perhaps this is something that comes from the vertebrate um, survival reptilian brain. Uh, but this is conserved, obviously, f in what this is an, it's almost like a nervous system reaction, if we're not talking about the brain, <laughs> like some kind of mm -hmm. instinct, mm -hmm. neural network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, this is more linked. The theory says that it's more linked to your metabolism. And that's why they're talking about anemona, being bold or shy. How do they measure anemona, right? What is the test for saying personality in anemona? They touch the anemona and they, it closes, right? It closes, the anemona closes. If it opens faster, it's bold. If it takes too long to open, it's shy. And they relate to this, to the rate of metabolism. So it seems that individuals that have faster metabolism, they need more food, they are bolder. And individuals that are slower metabolism, they are shyer. But that's an open question, precisely. <laughs> so it would not be, that's why it's conserved access. It's not only related to the brain, but more to metabolism. And that's what I'm saying. But if you have brain, you are not constrained to these two reaction. Your brain puts other strategies for you to deal with that. That was the argument. You are more complex than the, just this. <laughs> um, there are uh, many comments of gratitude. Uh, I'd like to read a few. Uh, one from uh, someone adjusting to a new job saying thank you and that she will consider uh, eating everything and being more quiet as an adaptation <laughs> to her new job. Um, uh, Akarsh uh, said, thank you for the presentation. Open my eyes on how humans really are just animals and how small changes in history could have these uh, animals evolve into dominant species. Uh, Sienna, thank you so much. I learned about the behaviors of capuchin um, monkeys and how that behavior can be quite similar to human behavior. Great, great presentation. Um, uh, 
just want to say thank you for the talk uh, from Nick Park, a physicist who a teacher, physics teacher. Um, from Abby, this talk has been super enriching. Thank you so much for your time. It was really interesting to learn about the intersection between pure and social sciences and how they build on one another. Um, from Sienna, um, oh, I think she repeated her message. Uh, from Eden, um, thank you for sharing your trajectory and your work. I'm fascinated by your field study. From Sophia, Thank you. It was very nice to understand how other species can help themselves, help humans help themselves. Who knew capuchin monkeys could answer our exist uh, existential questions? Uh, Trish, uh, Trishiani uh, said, thank you for such an amazing presentation. I learned so much from this, pre from this presentation, mainly the field you are in and the intersection between human and animal behaviors as being bulimic it was really interesting. I found that absolutely fascinating also. Um, and also from Giovanni, uh, thank you, Dr. Ferreira. I learned a lot about how our behaviors are so similar to that of capuchin monkeys. Um, from Amy, uh, thank you so much. This was very interesting. Um, let's see. I learned a lot from Catherine. I learned a lot about monkeys and their behavior. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the great presentation from David. I found it incredibly interesting how complex capuchin monkeys are socially and how monkeys are that are were less active, more submissive, had a greater chance of survival, which was very captivating. Kopika, thank you for teaching us all about your field study and for the interesting correlation done between capuchin monkeys and humans. Um, from Carl Emil, it was very, thank you, it was very interesting learning about capuchin monkeys and their behavior. A highly interesting and informative presentation from Abud. I found the studies presented were very enriching, mind-blowing. Thank you for giving us some of your precious time. Nadia thanks you for the opportunity to learn and expand her knowledge on the animal kingdom. Um, uh, Hugo says, I'm surprised at the similarities between the behaviors of humans and monkeys, the cap capuchin monkeys. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll copy all of these into uh, an email to you so you can see you. These, uh, all the love coming your way to you. Thank you. I think I would like to say to invite you to visit the Instagram. Uh, they are kept by my students, so they'll be happy. And actually, um, Maybe we can talk. Uh, one of my goals here is actually, if you want to come, as I said, it's uh, you can join our team in any part of this process, right? Since from scanning the animals, from health, from behavior, from trying to follow them in the field, if you're brave enough to go to the field. So you are mostly welcome, maybe as a part of the discipline of uh, summer courses or we are super open to receive. It's good for this exchange and idea. My the, my goal is to pair students. So I'd have one student of mine paired with you so we could work together there. And as I said, you can prepare a whole group of this and join this. So it's every six months we have groups. So you can join that in any phase of the procedure, uh, either voluntarily or as part of your final course or anything that we can think about something that Stephanie, Siani, if you <laughs> we can talk about that was the goal. Thank you. That's a very uh, generous uh, invitation. Uh, would you please um, add into the chat so students might be able to contact you, uh, your Instagram page, as well as um, maybe another way to contact you if you'd like. Let me go to the chat here. I, I'll stop sharing so I can see how is the chat here. Maybe this is something to think about for the future because we do have the possibility at school of developing uh, courses that have a trip component and like a week long uh, stage somewhere. So in the yes. past students have been to Costa Rica Maybe we could develop something with Brazil in the future. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, because of all this COVID stuff, 
Yeah, now we don't know. But <laughs> if yeah. you find a vaccine and the vaccine is sufficient, maybe. Yeah. But still, yeah, we have 20 years and you're mostly welcome to come and join us in for 15 days, one month. And in any period of that, that was the goal to, I, I told myself, I'm, I'm here to build corridors between mm -hmm. students. So you could come here and they could come you could come to Brazil, they could come here, and we could exchange idea and experience. It's super important for the students. Awesome, thank you. That's the Instagram, you can see more things there. And my email if you want to get in contact. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a fantastic week. Thank you, and the students are super kind and participative. <laughs> Would you have time for just, um, there's uh, two more questions yeah. Yeah. from the same student. Um, Eden is asking, have you studied animals living in the Amazon? If so, how would you describe their displacement patterns as the forest is further exploited? Through the displacement, how do you, how do previously isolated species interact with other species? Okay. And, I, yeah, he has another question following up about the should I to ask you that now um he said for the 20 percent release uh, monkeys that survived uh were they thriving in the new environment upon return did you and your team notice any behavioral discrepancies from when these monkeys were being studied in captivity so in Amazonia I do not study but I stood in the Atlantic forest the Atlantic, so it's something I, it's a part of the, I did not present here, I tried to focus only one, but I do have this other study in Atlantic forest. And what is happening also in Amazonia, I suppose, but mainly Atlantic forest, when you have these fragments that you, you put species together, if are this from the same genus, for example, we have an area in Brazil that uh, it was a, a dam was built for hydroelectric, and we have three species now connected, uh, Libidinosus, Flavius, and Chantosternus. And what is taking place there is that they are hybridizing between the, themselves. And hybrids apparently are fertile. And this is also a, a, a nice area of research which is called macroevolution. Macroevolution is when you, you make major leaps. Huh? So you have two species that put together as a new one, poof, from one generation to another, poof, macroevolution. What I study is actually called microevolution, which is actually closer to the, the other student um, from Galapagos Islands, which is fast microevolution. So all this human alteration of habitats is changing the Darwinian perspective of evolution because Darwinian thought about slow microevolution. And what we are seeing now is fast microevolution or macroevolution because of this change. So these are two new areas that is Darwin did not thought about that. And we are seeing and it's happening. So it was a truth that we did not know. So this is new areas of biology that are open to us, to you mainly to know how it is to improve in Darwin's theory, in Darwin's model, because he thought about slow and slow micro. And we are seeing that fast micro is possible and macro is possible. It's happening. So let's study and let's understand. What was the other question? Um, the survivorship. When I said to 20% is 20% confirmed survivorship. But there is a part of the animals that simply disappear. So about 40% of animals, we simply do not see them. So we do not know if they die or if they're alive somewhere. Because our radio colors, they last for six months. <laughs> so after six months, we do not know what is going on. So they can simply decide, we do not know if they die or if they live somewhere. That's why one of the focus now is to see actual movement and not only survivorship, because maybe if these animals are going further and further and further, we can infer that they just change the area and not die. 
I still have 20 years, 25 for studying. <laughs> Hmm. It just seems more questions bring up more questions, and it's uh, fascinating. Hmm. It's it seems too short to uh, hmm. uh, let you go, and we I would wish we could continue the conversation. Hmm. I think we should probably wrap it up, but um, we're very grateful for for you sharing your. Um, time, your expertise, your questions, and um, and uh, your openness to more questions, mm -hmm. and your generosity in, in that wonderful invitation to have an exchange. I I, I thank you. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I and I think uh, our students would benefit by seeing the new environment. I don't know what we would have to offer in our <laughs> our boreal forest. There's we don't have monkeys here, so, but mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's a nice experience. I think. I think that staying there for one month, it's it should be a nice experience. You know, you have the field site, so the students can. We have a field camp that is there, but uh, of course there is the cost of flight, so mm -hmm. it's not just taking a car and go there. But for those that are willing, it's there's space for that, and and it's good. It's good. This exchange of experience. I received it already. I'm in my fourth student receiving from England. I have a partnership in England. One of them is doing her PhD and three did her, their masters there. And so, and it's super good. My students love it. They practice English. They have another experience. They form friendships. One of them travel. And so it's good. It's good. One month, two months. It's something I wish I could form partnerships for. Yeah, wonderful then. Mm -hmm. All right, let's work on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hope so. <laughs> thank you for the invitation and congratulations for the week. It's oh, fantastic. Thank you for thank being Thank you so here. much. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye okay, all.